Hey Leader, and welcome to episode number 337 of the L3 Leadership Podcast, where we are obsessed with helping you grow to your maximum potential and to maximize the impact of your leadership. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host, and today's episode is brought to you by my friends at Baritung Advisors. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope that you'll enjoy our content and become a subscriber. Know that you can also watch all of our episodes over on our YouTube channel, so make sure you're subscribed there as well. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a while and it's made an impact on your life, it would mean the world to me if you would leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever app you listen to podcasts through. That really does help us to grow our audience and reach more leaders. So thank you in advance for that. Well, leader, in today's episode, you'll hear my conversation with Aaron Hatsakostas, which is a fun name to say. If you're unfamiliar with Aaron, let me tell you a little bit about her. Aaron is a former corporate CEO turned founder of Be Authentic, Inc., She's an author, a TEDx and keynote speaker, a career coach, podcast co-host, and running man enthusiast. At the age of 42, Erin became the CEO of a nine-figure, 1,000-employee healthcare financial company where she led a massive turnaround, tripling earnings and sending employee engagement skyrocketing in just three years. And just when things were going great, Erin decided to walk away from the corporate world. She realized that it was her reliance on authenticity that not only allowed her to say yes to the big girl job, but also to achieve incredible results. Through her company, Be Authentic Inc., she's on a hell-bent mission to eradicate the all-too-fake corporate environment by inspiring and enabling an army of people to crush their career without compromising everything else. Erin is the friend, the mom, coach, guru, and boss that you've always wanted, all ruled in to one. And in our conversation, you'll hear Erin and I talk about how authenticity can be your superpower in your career. We talk about what she calls the compromise calculation, which is something she uses to make decisions. We talk about how she had employee engagement skyrocket and how you can too. We talk about leadership development. And of course, we take her through the lightning round and so much more. You're going to love this. You're going to get so much out of this interview. But before we dive into that, just a few announcements. This episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast is sponsored by Baritung Advisors. The financial advisors at Baritung Advisors help educate and empower clients to make informed financial decisions. You can find out how Baritung Advisors can help you develop a customized financial plan for your financial future by visiting their website at baratungadvisors.com. That's B-E-R-A-T-U-N-G advisors.com. Securities investment products and services offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA and SIPC, Baratung Advisors, LPL Financial, and L3 Leadership are separate entities. I also want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They're a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny. And my wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers, and we just loved our experience. And not only do they have great jewelry, but they also invest in people. In fact, for every couple that comes in engaged, they give them a book to help them prepare for marriage. And we just love that. So if you are in need of a good jeweler, check out hennyjewelers.com. And with all that being said, let's dive right in. Here's my conversation with Aaron. Hey, Aaron. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm so excited for this conversation together. And, you know, as I've researched you, you had, have had an amazing career um, with lots of twists and turns. And you've had multiple positions. And you always use this statement that I, I actually never heard of uh, prior to being exposed to your work. But every time you had a career decision to make, whether or not to take a next job, you talk about the compromise calculation. And I just want you to, to talk to leaders today. Uh, about their decision making. What is the compromise calculation and how do you use it in your life? Yeah. So first of all, I'm not surprised you haven't heard of it because I made it up. Um, But it was my (laughs) way of bringing tangibility to something that not only always ran through my head, but I know runs through a lot of other people's heads as they're making a decision around their career. And um, I'll just tell you a story about, you know, I was kind of rising in my career and uh, one day on a Friday, my boss called me, he was our COO. And he was like, I'm sorry to do this on a Friday. It's a little bit heavy, but I'm leaving the company. And I want to know though, if it's okay to recommend you as my successor, as the next COO. And I paused and I replied really quickly, no, thank you. And in that like three second pause, I ran this compromise calculation in my head. And, And the compromise calculation is essentially... We think anyway, that there's this hard-coded anti-correlation between our rising career success and everything else in our life. So whether that's our family, our kids, our relationship with our our, uh, spouse, our uh, health, and sometimes even who we are. So as we rise, we're going to have to 
we're going to have to give up just as much. And so I ran this calculation really quick and I was like, okay, more pay, more authority, but, you know, more compromise on all the other things that I care about. And it's just not worth it. Like I'm already making good money and I'm doing good things. And so um, this is what I ran. And, you know, just to complete the story, you know, the, the weekend though, you know, he was really good about sort of, he was persuasive. Uh, he said, think about it over the weekend. And of course, over the weekend, I, you know, saw advice from all kinds of people who I thought, oh, they'll have the answer. They're going to have the answer. Of course they didn't. The answer, you know, I really had to come up with. But what I realized, Doug, was that I I wasn't worried about the traditional like imposter syndrome and all this, especially for us women that we hear about all the time. It's like, I knew by that point you had to kind of lean over the edge. You had to be 50% uncomfortable in each role. But what I was worried about, it was that I would have to become like these executives that I saw before me. Right. And, you know, I saw the, you know, the travel, the divorces, the heart attacks, the, the icky personalities, the burnt out. And, and I'm like, I don't want that. I don't need to go any further to have that. But, and then I had this epiphany and there's this phrase that I, it's like, it's like my salt and pepper. I put it on everything that, that hit me was, you know, you shouldn't not do something because you hate the way it was done before. Mm. Instead, why don't you do it your own way? Um, You don't have to follow the path of everybody. And so uh, even though I ran that compromise calculation, that was the first time I really started to to debunk it. And I went back and, and, and said, yes, that next, that next Monday. Yeah. And I know you're all about authenticity, right? That's pretty much your whole brand now is, is be authentic. Uh, and I'm curious. So I, I want to hear a little bit about how you did that. I know you ended up becoming CEO and, and crushing it. But when it comes to authenticity and leading your own way, uh, can you talk about the tension between being your authentic self and actually still producing results? Because I'm assuming, you know, if you jumped in as CEO, if you were authentic but weren't producing, <laughs> it may not be okay. How do you balance that tension or how do you see it play out in the workplace? So the first thing I will tell you is authenticity does not mean be yourself. Um, I call that faux fo- authentic. You know, that, that's the same conundrum. What you just laid out is a conundrum. Most people are like, that sounds amazing. Like, I should be <laughs> myself. And then you're like, oh, crap. Like, not only I, but, it, you know, everybody's going to come to work. And, and what I call faux authentic is bringing your whole shitty self to work. Like, that's that's not authenticity. Um, there's actually a root word to it, authenticos. And it means to be genuine. But it also means to be original and authoritative. Mm. And if you really think about the people that you know that are authentic, they're not like they don't they don't come to work like they would come to Joe's pool party. There is something more nuanced, there is something more edgy. Um and and so that's the first thing I'll say. And we can talk more about it. I mean, I do. I preach and teach it and I do not like I'm not a pastor, I'm not a sermon. I don't walk around and giving people like the permission to be authentic. I actually believe authenticity isn't a permission. It's a power and there's tangibility to it. There's things you can do, things you, especially in the workplace, you have to rewire. And that's why I have a whole framework around it and stuff. But to go back, like, you know, I wasn't some genius. First of all, I had no idea that's what it was. I didn't put that label on on it until I retired from my corporate job. But the best way to understand it is, and I didn't know this until I wrote my book because I had time to sit down and reflect, where my authenticity as, as a strategy almost came from was my father. So my father was a teacher for about 30 years. And then, uh, and then he sold real estate uh, for the last maybe 20 years. And, you know, he would come home from school every day. And, you know, most people come home and they like complain and like, you know, tell stories about this kid did that or where he is sort of vetting venting. And he instead would come home and every day he would tell these stories and he would tell these stories about like, oh, I had kids in class that hadn't been listening. So, you know, I decided to put a tape player down and just walk out of the room with, I'm a blank, I'm a blank, I'm a blank up on the, on the marker board. And he, so he played, um, I'm a steamroller baby. And so his whole point was, I'm a steamroller, right? I'm a napalm bomb. Like there's different blanks. And that was his way. The kids were really confused at first and they kind of got it. Oh, we're supposed to listen and figure out what, you know, each are. 
that's how he, you know, instead of somebody that yelled at kids or put them in the corner or moved them away from their friends, like those are the kinds of things he did that was every day was different, was authentic, was unique and how he taught. And I would hear those stories. And, and I also knew about the success he had. He was a beloved teacher. And then later as he, as he went into real estate, I mean, crushed it. And it was the same strategy. He wasn't the, the normal sales guy, the normal real estate agent. And so what I had learned from him was this, this correlation between doing things differently, doing them your own way, being authentic and success. And so when, you know, when I took the COO job and sort of had this epiphany, like I don't have to, you know, sacrifice as much. I don't have to do it just like everybody else. The reality is the formula formula I used wasn't that much different than what I had been doing that had got me to that point, had got me the success that had them wanting me to, to step into this position. And it really was about, you know, bucking the norm. Um, you know, so so as I started to get into the COO position and then eventually the CEO position, you know, I'll give you some examples. Like, for example, I I didn't how to didn't know how to negotiate. Like I never went to some school or I never was in a big job where I did a lot of negotiations and had a great mentor. And when I took over the job of, as COO, I remember we had this huge contract we had to renegotiate. It was like critical to the business. And I went into the meeting and the guy on the other side of the table, if you will, the other executive, you know, I was like, what's important to you in this? And he's like, he, he, I don't think he saw it coming. And he like, of course, when you don't see it coming, what happens? You tell the truth. <laughs> and then he turned it around to me. He said, well, what's important to you? And actually I was interim CEO at the time that we were negotiating. And I remember Doug just like puking out. I was like, well, our financials are really struggling. And if I can get this negotiation to a good deal, I'll have a good shot at becoming the CEO. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I just told him that. But I will tell you that deal, which we, we went into it. They wanted to raise our rates. We left it. We got a 10% reduction. And this is a very complicated deal. I'm simplifying it, but that's really where we landed. But I firmly believe that the executive on the other end, he really fought for me, He fought against procurement and his lawyers and fought to have this deal more because he was like, yeah, I, I like Aaron and I'd like to help her try to get into this, this bigger role, you know, permanently as well. And, you know, so it was everything from that to, you know, once I became executive, I started having corporate comm people that would write all my stuff for, you know, <laughs> org announcements. And I remember Doug one day, it was one of the first ones this guy had written for me. He was like my designated corp com. And I remember getting it and getting ready to like redline it. Cause I knew I'd have to make some changes. And I just looked at it and I was like, I don't even know where to start. I don't understand what he's talking about. Like, and That's how can awesome. I send this to my people? Like all these buzzwords and crap. And I'm like, what does this actually mean? And so I made a decision early on that I would write my own communications. I and mean, we had this major, major reorganization at the parent company where it was this coordinated effort. They paid consultants, got zillions of dollars over many months where we all had to look at our organizations and restructure. And then it was like this, highly coordinated communication plan. And mine, it didn't have my picture on it. I wrote it. I probably told a story in it. I, I was like, I am not writing communications people won't listen to. You know, so I would just, you know, it was everything from that to when I went into executive reviews, quarterly business reviews, like I didn't blow smoke. Like I didn't do propaganda. I would tell a story. I would uh, tell them where we were red. You know, I wouldn't go in there all, oh, we're green and we're yellow. Like, no, some of the things we were doing were in red status. And it helped me get noticed from executives. It helped build trust. They didn't ever worry about what I'd be hiding. It helped negotiations. And the biggest thing, Doug, I got the best talent. I got the best freaking talent and I kept the best talent because it's a popularity contest, right? Where when we were talking about leadership, I say it flippantly, but I am sort of not flippant. It is a popularity contest. In the end, that is our job is to get the best talent. And when you're known as whatever word you want to call it, authentic or approachable or this good leader that's nice or whatever they want to call me, 
um, word got out and I started to get some of the best talent in the organization. And um, so, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the results spoke for themselves. I mean, we, we had flat earnings. Uh, when I took over, earnings had been flat at 17 million for at least four years. Uh, it was integration. It was acquisition. Uh, really, we're struggling to kind of stop treading water and and increase increase our earnings. And um, when I left three years later, when I retired, we were at fifty million. We had tripled our wow. earnings, and um, and employee engagement, not shockingly, went up too. We I think it was twelve percentage points in the last two years. And so, and it was a, a loaded question, a little bit of a softball, a little bit of a passion. But like, I don't teach authenticity as a permission. I actually teach it as a means to an end of success. Not as a, oh, you know, try to have both. I firmly believe that's what drove my success and what can drive others. That's so good. And so when you walked in, you just mentioned when you became the CEO, employee engagement, I wanted to focus on that too. So you, you attracted great talent. I've never heard leadership be called a popularity contest, but I love that too. I love all these one-liners. Um, but what did you do within, I mean, three years is a pretty short period of time too. What did you do to, to really boost and employee engagement? Was it just communications from you? Was it just getting the right people in place? Because I think so many, I mean, we're living in, you know, the great resignation. People are leaving companies for companies. People want to be part of an awesome culture. Leaders are struggling everywhere to keep their employees engaged and just keep them, period. Um, what, what did you do and what advice do you have for leaders on creating yeah. an uh, engaging culture? It's a great question. I mean, I will say the first chess move was actually financial. So the first thing I did wasn't like, you know, the answer you might expect is like, hi, you know, it was all people. I actually started first with, we needed some breathing room. And I started with a couple of key negotiations. We actually, Mm. we actually had our largest channel partner. It was 17% of our revenue. Um, And I had actually our CFO cost accountant and realized that we were losing our shirts, like, you know, high revenue super, super high expense, like losing close to 17 million a year, which is not good when your bottom line is 17 million. And um, so we, we, we actually sent them a letter to terminate uh, with, with an intent to renegotiate. So my first move was actually to get some financial breathing room. So we renegotiated that crazy outcome, 50% increase in our revenue the next year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And this other deal that I told you about was, which was a different one. Once I could have a little bit of breathing room, because you're right, people people want to win more than yeah, anything. Yes. They want to be part of a winning team. And if you are treading water, literally barely able to breathe financially, it's pretty hard to win. It's pretty hard to have happy people. So once we got that breathing room, it was like it was like starting up the car. Okay, we, you know, it, it was clunking. It was clunking. We finally got it really started, and then it was really about. It was about energy. It was about authenticity. It was about me getting involved with the teams in a way that most leaders didn't. Like I said, I wrote all my communications. I told stories. I went and visited teams, but I didn't visit them and do the typical, like, tell me the 72 things that are wrong and we'll take it back to headquarters and fix it. Like, no, I went there and coached them how to start to overcome it and got them excited. and. Um, and then, you know, once we kind of got started to get the vibe going and people get excited, we invested, we invested a, a pretty good penny in leadership coaching. We spent about a year with a group um, and we did everything. Every single leader went through it. We had wow. about a hundred, about a hundred people leaders in the organization culminated with a, a, a three-day event at our headquarters and um, that was probably the big, big turning point. Then it was like, okay, now. I mean, after we started doing that, I didn't have to do much, right? Wow. Because I, we had a team that was high performing. There were a few people after that too. And people that are listening know this. One of the things you do with any kind of investment in your people is partly to invest in them and build them up. It's partly to also see who's bought in and who's not. And there's always a few people that don't, you know, they go through all that and they're still kind of not great leaders. And, and so you've got to make some tough decisions, which we did. 
Um, but w- once we got to that place, so I would say it was finding the financial breathing room, increasing the frequency and the vibe through using my authenticity, being somebody people are excited to work with, getting my hands dirty and working with them, and then really investing in them. And um, and that's why it was only three years, Doug. I mean, wow. I, it was four years if you include COO, three years as CEO. The engine was running and I wasn't as... Um, I wasn't as challenged anymore because everybody was mm. off and running and doing great. And even though I wanted to be like, okay, ride this out. Like, this is awesome. Like stuff's not blowing up. Our, our CFOs love us. They're like, we're went from being in the doghouse to being the golden child. But the reality is um, I'm, I'm driven by exponential challenge. And, and so once I had kind of completed that turnaround, it was time to, to let them set sail and, and work on my next thing. Well, I'm going to hop into that. I guess my only follow-up question would just be on the communication front. uh, How often did you send out? I think you had a thousand employees. How often would you communicate? I was just interviewing um, Ginger Hartage, who was at Southwest for for years. And I think their CEO, literally one of their CEOs for like 25 years, sent a weekly video communication. I was like, wow, that that is communicating. I'm just curious. What was your your cadence as a leader? So I can't tell you a cadence because... um, I don't work well if it's planned because if it's planned, it feels forced. And if it's feel forced, it's not authentic. Um, so mine were when I had something to say. Okay. Right. I and love so, it. so sometimes that was four times in a month. And sometimes that was once a month. Um, usually I tried to wrap it around some other things they needed to know, but, you know, have an opportunity to kind of give them an update. Um, but yeah, from a from a general, but you know, I was always around. I was meeting with different teams. And so communications obviously goes well beyond, you know, the town hall. The town halls we would do once a quarter. Um but yeah, I mean, meeting with teams, to me, communication is it goes well beyond sort of that formal like email or or video that people do. God bless people that can do that. <laughs> um but I'm I'm sort of one of those people, it's like, oh my God, when I have something to say, then that's the time that that you're going to get a communication. And, and just out of curiosity, you talked about the leadership uh, training program you took your whole company through. Are you able to share what that company was or what I would just be interested in, in the resource or service that you used? Yeah, we worked with a group locally called the Alchemy Group. It's a real small boutique, boutique okay. group. Um, a couple of women that, that started it came out of GE. And um, it was really impactful for us. It it um, it, it, ta- it was a very broad sort of curriculum and kind of everything in, in leadership. Um, but it was, a it was a great, you know, it was a great solution for our team for what we needed then. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. And I did want to just go back and comment, uh, when you talked about that first negotiation that you had and just Mm. asked what's important to you. I I mean, I think it's so funny. Like I, I, so many, so many employee issues could be resolved if you just ask each other, what do you want or what's important to you? Like that question is a game changer. So I just want to reemphasize, just asking people what's important, like literally that'll solve so much so fast. Right? So, so thank yeah. you for sharing that. So yeah. you had the skyrocket growth in three years, but I, you already shared why you left. Uh, I loved it when you said that you need to, to be exponentially challenged. And so you reached this point where you weren't challenged and you you jumped off to, to do your own challenge. Can you talk about what you jumped to do and what you're doing now? Yeah. I mean, this is a really interesting story. I had always, I had started to realize throughout my career that the same thing would happen about every three years, just when logic would say, enjoy the ride. Like you now are the person to go to work is easier because you understand what you're talking about. And then I would just start to feel though, I start to feel like lazy. And I don't like to feel lazy because I've always been, you know, in the overachiever category. And I realized a couple rolls in, I was like, oh, you have this problem. You're motivated by big challenges. So while one part of your brain wants to sit and like cruise control, then you're going to get mad at yourself because you're going to be bored. You're not going to be energized. You're not going to be inspired to kind of go above and beyond. So this happened again to me after, you know, kind of turning this company around Um, And I remember those sitting in the office, Karen Lynch, she was now the CEO for CVS and she was a big sponsor of mine. And I remember sitting in her huge, beautiful office and she's like, so what do you want to do next? And she's like, what about this? Or what about that? And um, it's like, you know, when you go to a restaurant and you sort of 
maybe it's just me, but like kind of <laughs> fake try on the menu. You're like thinking through what you want and you're like, Oh, does tacos? No, tacos doesn't feel good. You know, does a burger? Oh, maybe, you know, and you're sort of trying to taste it, you know, virtually. And that's what I was doing as she was throwing out these opportunities. And I was like, Oh my God, nothing tasted good. And I remember trying to be, uh, you know, nice about it though. Cause I didn't want to be like, no, no, no. And you know, every other one I'd be like, well, what I like about that is this, but what I'm not sure about is this. And, and it really made me realize I need to do something new. And so it's kind of an interesting story. I, I started to think, you know, I've been at this company, the parent company for 22 years. Um, and I, I feel like maybe I want to go out on my own, or I want to run a smaller healthcare company, or I didn't know exactly what it was, build, build a software. I didn't, I didn't know. It certainly wasn't what I'm doing now. And I was on a plane and I was next to this really nice woman. And she, she had spent about 10 years in corporate. And then the last like 20 years, she'd been running her own HR consulting business. And um, I'm just asking her question after question. And she just seems so happy. And I'm just diving in and and finally, I I just stopped and I was like, I'm I'm sorry, I'm asking you so many questions. I said, and this is the first time I'd said it out loud, which is right. This is what we do on planes because we get these like free, you know, counselors that we know we're never going to see again. And I'm like, I had been thinking it, but I, I so I say out loud to her, I said, because I'm thinking about leaving and doing my own thing. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I, and I said to her, I go, oh but that would be so stupid right now. My, you know, my reputation's at an all time high. I've got all these opportunities they're throwing at me. And and like, I almost was like trying to retract it and put it back inside. And she looked at me and so succinctly, so quickly, so matter of factly, she just goes, who says this is the top. Mm. Wow. And I was like, right. You can see the metaphor. You're probably like, like immediately, like the metaphor came to life. And I was like, Oh my God, I don't, I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it looks like at the top of that other mountain, or I don't know what the path feels like walking up or like the metaphor just immediately. And I, I very quickly got more scared of not knowing than I got scared of leaving. And, and, and part of that was very practical. I was like, I'm leaving when things are good. So like worst case scenario, I'm back in a year or whatever. I haven't burned bridges. I'm not saying that people just take me no problem, but I, but I knew that. And, and so that started me in the courageous sort of journey to say, you know, after all the success at 44 years old, I'm retiring from this company that uh, the parent company had been not for, for a long time. And, but only been CEO of the, of the subsidiary company for three years. And, and what happened, Doug was, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but like 75% of the messages kept saying the same thing. They kept saying, we're going to miss your authentic leadership. And it wasn't like the word calling me authentic wasn't the surprising thing. Like, okay, I like, yeah, I guess I'm pretty authentic, but I had never been kind of pinned with that badge. I had never had like this constant. And, and so when I left, I, I actually started, I built this software company, which here's my air quotes, because I never actually like built anything. I did like the business case and I got a cute logo. And then I was like, oh crap, I don't actually like to build things. Building and creating are very different things. And, but I had thought about this career and leadership space because I knew I had some, some good energy there, but you know, I didn't want to do it at first because I didn't want to be like everybody else. Mm. I was like, oh, there's like 8,000, you know, career (laughs) leadership people. They're like a dime a dozen. Like I'm not a dime. Like I'm, unique. And, and guess what I thought I would, you know, I eventually, um, yeah, I blogged a little bit and then I was like, wait a minute, you shouldn't not do something because you hate the way it's done before instead do it your own way. Right. And I was like, what if I did career and leadership totally different? What if I took everything I don't like about it and reversed it? What if I made it sassier and fun, more fun and shorter and like just kind of all the things that I didn't love about it, but that were more me, um, and so that's when I really started down this, this journey and, and putting the authenticity with that. Um, and it was probably, it wasn't immediate. It was over the next six to nine months, especially as I started writing my book because it forced me to slow down, slow my role and think about things till I really connected the dots. Like what I talked about is that not, I was authentic and oh, wasn't that nice to be able to be authentic and have results. I connected the dots that it was my authenticity 
that drove the results because of the things that I mentioned. And that's, that's when I was like, oh, okay, no, this is what I need to do because not only are people miserable and I could have gone out and given them permission, but now I, I can also give them not just permission, but this power to say, and if you are more human and more original and more authentic, you will actually have better results. And that's when it all clicked for me. And, and I just started, you know, going crazy down this path of, of trying to change, you know, change the working world to be more authentic. It's so good. And so before we dive into the lightning round, I would just say, you know, how is that journey going? And if leaders are listening to this and connecting with you, how can leaders, you know, connect with the work you're doing and, and take advantage of your services? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been mm-hmm. amazing. And the main reason it's been amazing, Doug, is that the words I say, whether it's in my book, in a LinkedIn post, how I talk about it is so insanely liberating for so many people. I I feel like I'm saying the things that so many people have had dormant and think they're the only ones Mm. that are thinking it or wanting it. So that's probably the most exciting part of it. Um, I also love, I'm a keynote speaker. It's where I'm meant to be. Um, but the biggest thing with with leadership and the way they can work with me is, you know, I can do everything from energizing their team through virtual and person keynotes, but I also have a workshops and a framework around something I call the six principles of strategic authenticity, and it has an acronym called HUMANS, and it helps. It's not the acronym like the fluffy BS that you read in Forbes and it's like, oh, you have to be more humble and you have to like, no, it's actually actionable things. So I teach people, for example, H is for humility. And we work on actually using humility as a way to connect and build trust in the places people least expect it. So for example, when you're first meeting somebody in a business, uh, maybe a business meeting, sales meeting, or in an interview or a a new executive that comes in. And so with each of the principles, we actually dive into them and I teach them how to use them to build that trust, that connection and, and the results. And what's most exciting, I think the biggest epiphany I've had is that I, I, my sweet spot really is working with those small and mid size where not only am I sort of, the HR side, which makes me cringe a little bit because I'm a businesswoman, um, <laughs> not anything about HR people, but, but energize and and get people, uh, you know, more effective, more engaged in their job. But what I've also realized, and I'm working with a company now to do the full circle. And what I mean by that is to teach them how to fish through sort of the, the, the coaching that I do and the consulting I do around humans and around strategic authenticity, but also look at their business and find those places and opportunities, whether it's in their RFP responses or in their sales meetings or how they're talking to customers, how do they start actually applying authenticity in some really key places? And so actually helping them fish right alongside them to implement it as well. And that's where I've gotten really excited because I love going into these, these smaller to mid-sized companies and not just firing them up, but but literally helping them change the results in a short time by making some really, really fun and bold, but but simple changes. Yeah. Well, congrats to you and kudos for you to, to make that jump. And, uh, and we'll include links to all of your, your stuff in the podcast or in the show notes as well. So with the time we have left, I just want to jump into the lightning round, just a all bunch right. of fun questions. Um, first one is, what is the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? Yeah. You know, it has to be my dad. And it wasn't advice. It was his the way he demonstrated authenticity, which... Mm is actually the M in humans modeling. And so I would have to say the advice that he modeled for me was by far the most impactful I've ever had. If you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Uh, People respect authority, but they follow authenticity. Mm. What's one or two books that have impacted you deeply in your your life that you'd recommend others read? So the one that like exponentially impacted me more than any other book was uh, You Are a Badass by by Jen uh, Sincero. And it's for two reasons. One, what she taught me as 
as somebody that was consuming it and, and having the courage, right, to, to go out into this new profession and everything that it contained. But probably more impactful was the way she wrote that. That was the first kind of nonfiction self-help book I had read that had authenticity, had personality, had sass. And so when I wrote my book, that was my inspiration. I was like, oh my God, I'm not that I wrote nearly as good as Jen can write, but it really inspired me to write this, what traditionally is a nonfiction snoozy book, not snoozy at all. So, I mean, there's a lot of great books, but You Are a Badass is is the one I always recommend. Favorite podcast that you listen to? Oh, I'm a podcast junkie. I love um, how I built this. Uh, and the reason I love that one, one, it's a great podcast, but I listen with my son. So he's, um, mm. he's a hockey player. So we, we drive half an hour to his rank at minimum. Um, he's also a talker. And if I don't put on a podcast, he'll drive me nuts. <laughs> And I think he is no doubt going to be an entrepreneur someday. He's only 11, but he um, he's a, just a brilliant mind. And he's also never going to be able to work for somebody. So I love that podcast because it's one of those that I think is going to really shape him um, and and bring him forward. But I also love um, I also love Speakernomics. I'm a, a huge junkie of just constantly getting better at keynote speaking. And that's probably my favorite one that really helps me constantly improve uh, my keynote speaking ability. Well, I'll have to check that out. Um, you ask, you have your own podcast. You interview people a lot. Mm-hmm. You spend a lot of time with people. I'm curious, when you get to spend time with a leader, do you have a go-to question that you always love to ask? Yeah. I mean, so one of my f- favorite questions would be, you know, if you could accomplish blank in the next six months and you would jump for joy, what would it be? Um, yeah, I'm a big believer in powerful questions. And, you know, whether it's adding the blank Um, adding the one thing is one of the hacks, adding a limiter. So a lot of times too, I'll ask them if there's what, you know, if I went out to your team and I asked them, what's the one thing you really need, you don't have, what would they say? I love that one. Cause they have to put their mind, you know, their head into the minds of their people. Um, yeah. So those are probably two of my favorite, but I'm, I'm a real junkie on powerful questions. So good. I'm looking forward to the answer to this one. What is your biggest leadership pet peeve? (laughs) <laughs> one, one where do i start yeah. how long do we have doc yeah, yeah that's right your top the top yeah my top is uh scripting you know oh, leaders wow. that are you know super authentic and then they go into you know whether it's a communication or a town hall and their handlers i mean part of it's not their fault but their handlers want to like script out everything and then anything that's like scripted forget about it nobody's nobody's listening wow nobody's listening What's one thing that you've done in your life that you believe everyone should do before they die? Oh, well, from a fun perspective, I would say it was paragliding in Switzerland. So doing something oh, wow. crazy like that out in the Alps, uh, you know, top, top moment of my life. Um, not as sexy and cool. I get a coach. I wish mm. I, you know, I have an undergraduate degree. I have a master's degree. Like so many of your listeners spent right tons of money. Like where was this concept of understanding? I could just pay a coach. And I, I finally got an executive coach when I was like two years, three years into being CEO. I was like, oh, I, where were you before? So um, you don't have to be an executive to have a coach invest in yourself Everyone needs a coach. LeBron James has a coach. Everybody has a coach. Get a coach. If you can go back and have coffee with yourself at any age and you'd actually listen to yourself, <laughs> when would you have <laughs> when would you have coffee with yourself and what would you tell that version of Aaron? Uh, so first of all, I'd make sure it was decaf because I've learned I can't do caffeine at all. Um, <laughs> you'll figure. You know, for me, it would be probably around 11 or 12 years old. Um, and this isn't, professional, this is a woman, it, it would be um, all those things that you hate about your looks, you know, mm. you, you know, your, your big arms, your big forehead, your did it like, stop looking at the things that you hate. They're not as bad as you think. Um, embrace yourself. I mean, that's one thing. If you're listening and you're a woman and you're like about to hit 40 or not 40 yet, I swear to God, there's this magical thing. When you become 40, you just start to give like less Fs about everything, including your looks. And I, you know, for 40 years, you know, in various capacities, I feel like that was a struggle. And and I really wish I could 
I could tell my younger self, you know, I don't know, convince them not convince her not to worry about it. That's so good. Uh, and on the other end of your life, when you get to the end, what do you want to be remembered for? Oh, I mean, a couple things. One, I want to be remembered by my kids to be the person that demonstrated for them what they could be and inspired them to do that. And, and not for how many soccer games they took them to, or how many times I helped them with their homework. Mm. Um, you know, I, I always sort of parent my kids thinking, okay, what if they're, if they're on a podcast, let's say when they're like 30 years old, that's the kind of stuff you want to do for them because we all get on a podcast, right? Like I heard, I talked about my father. I'm sure you, you've heard it from other guests. It's not the, it's not the stuff we focus on. It's, it's the really more, you know, profound, but small and, and demonstrated things. And then, you know, more broadly, I mean, I want people to be like, oh my God, remember how crappy the working world was before Aaron taught us that authenticity was a power. Like, I I can't even believe we used to work in an environment that that was that stuffy and horrible. That's so great. Well, Aaron, this conversation has been rich. Thank you for being authentically you and not just keeping that to yourself, but sharing with the world. You're impacting leaders and people everywhere and making a difference. So thank you so much. And hopefully we'll get to do this again sometime. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Well, hey, Leader, thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Erin. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. You can find ways to connect with her and links to everything that we discussed in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash 337. And Leader, as always, I want to challenge you that if you want to 10x your growth this year, then you need to either launch or join an L3 Leadership Mastermind Group. Mastermind groups have been the greatest source of growth in my life over the last seven years. And if you don't know what they are, they're just simply groups of six to 12 leaders that meet together on a consistent basis for at least one year in order to help each other grow, hold each other accountable, and to do life together. If you're interested in learning more about mastermind groups, go to l3leadership.org forward slash masterminds. And as always, I like to end every episode with a quote. And today I'll quote Gerald Brooks, who said this. He said, people watch you long before they follow you. So if you couldn't say a word... Would anyone want to follow you? Such a great question. Well, Leader, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Know that Laura and I love you. We believe in you. And remember, don't quit. Keep leading. The world desperately needs your leadership. We'll talk to you next episode.